When did you play your first game? Uh, and it was the game. I was on there playing. Thank you for letting us interview you. One of the big questions I had, we've always heard Joe say that he won the role of Kane in a Cracker Jack box or the lottery or something. Well, <laughs> I, I, I heard him say that, but that's classic Joe. <laughs> Joe uh, earned the role of Kane. So Joe was a producer at Westwood. When I say producer, he was a games producer as well as a director for all of our talent. We were casting for the role of Kane at the time. Remember that Command and Conquer was the first uh, full screen uh, video project that we were doing. We had realized that we had to go out and get actors. Um, we did cast a lot of Westwood people in most of the roles because we had no money. We actually were out with a casting call for many, many actors to play the different roles. And we even had some budget for big names for the main characters. And so we had kicked around names like John Malkovich and others. Joe was reading the part of Kane for all the other actors, telling them how he wanted to have them react to Kane. And then when it came to casting Kane, we were sitting there looking through all the tapes and I distinctly remember myself and Brett having the conversation with Joe. And, um, you know, we said, look, I know this sounds, sounds like an awful lot to ask of you, but you're the best Kane we've got. By far, of all the people that we see reading for Kane, um, and we asked him if he would do it. I know Joe wouldn't say it, but but honestly, you know that's a that's a big professional commitment to be both the director and one of the lead characters in a production. And so um, I think we did a little bit of arm twisting, and um, uh, certainly he was more than up for the task. So that's that's the truth, and I th think probably he doesn't tell that story because it, it's it somewhat sounds self congratulatory, but but the truth is he earned it. Well, the other ones I was going to ask is um, not so much about Command and Conquer Dune. One of the very first RTSs. Like, how how did you guys come up with with Dune, and then it kind of evolved down the road into like Command and Conquer, and kind of giving birth to the RTS series. Sure. Well, my recollection, Brett was a big fan of a game called Rescue Raiders, which is really the sort of forerunner of um, tower defense games. And uh, Joe Bostic was a huge fan. I think most of us were a big fan of Military Madness on the Turbo Graphics that he's seen. And Military Madness was a turn-based war game, and Westwood had a long history at that point of doing war games for SSI. So we were all pretty well steeped in the uh, war game, strategy game genre. We were looking at the, the sort of console meets strategy game of military madness um, and the high-speed action of, a, of um, Rescue Raiders and really said, geez, that if you put those two things together, um, and Westwood had a history of doing real-time games that would otherwise normally be turn-based, that's with Eye of the Beholder and others. So we said, what if we just took this real-time, instead of real-time RPG, we made a real-time strategy game. At the time, that was almost heresy because serious strategy games, you know, you, you thought that you had to have time to really think about it. And I th that was actually the point was, well, what if you didn't have time? What if, um, what if the whole point was you had to be making these decisions while trying to balance all these things happening at you? That was the course that was set on. And the original uh, setting for the game was certainly not, I think at Dune 2, it might have been early enough. It was some tanks and things like that, but it was early enough in when uh, Virgin came to us and said their Dune license was available. And again, Brett was a huge fan of Dune. In fact, actually, for one of the Christmas presents, I got him a first edition signed book from that, <laughs> how much of a fan he was way before the Dune game. And so he was really uh, super, super excited about the idea that we might do a Dune game. And so we said, look, let, let us have the license and we'll make a strategy game all about controlling the spice. My contribution to Dune was mostly in the art direction. I worked very closely with a guy named Ren Olson, who's passed away since since then. Since then, uh, but he was a really great pastel artist, and he set the, sto the tone and the style for the game to be this sort of sandy desert uh, kind of airish uh, feel to it. Very f for the time. I mean, I'm, I'm waxing poetically about a few pixels, but the reality was we put a lot of thought and hard work into the concept work to try to get the characters to feel reminiscent of the Dino De De Laurentiis film without being an exact uh, copy. We didn't have the film license. Actually, I think we did have the film license. We didn't have the book license. For the game itself, we really wanted this desert warfare. That was the biggest challenge, was in the relatively small amount of space that we had back then, making the Dune um, game feel like a big, expansive game with lots of different units and lots of different strategies you could do. You know, I, I kind of laugh nowadays when people talk about, they complain so heavily about the lack of processing speed and memory um, on tablets to, to do proper pathfinding and high-speed AI, and I'm thinking, wow, this thing already has thousands of times more processing power than we had to deal with at the time. <laughs> but no, that's that's how it came about. It became a, a combination of a couple different game styles that, in this case, real-time strategy. The reason it was called Dune 2 was really interesting too. There was another team in 
uh, Europe that was, I think in France, that was working on a Dune game and uh, had been told that uh, the game wasn't to go forward and they were going to uh, put them onto something else. And they said, sure. And they spun corpse in any ways. Um, and they were getting close to shipping a game. So they came back out and said, hey, we have this thing anyways. We think you'd really like it. And so they were going to hit the market just before us. And at the time, um, Virgin was like, well, you know, strategy games don't sell all that much, so uh, we'll just make it Dune 2. Nobody's going to care that much. Um, not realizing that they would have forever created a question in people's mind, which is why the very first real-time strategy game that we recognize today as real-time strategy was first called real-time strategy. That was really a Westwood thing. And why was it Dune 2 instead of Dune 1? And that's why. And the last one I had wanted to ask you was, um, okay, we had Dune 2. Where did the idea for Command and Conquer come from? Again, uh, my perspective, there would be uh, all sorts of positions on this, but after Dune 2, we knew we had something pretty special. I believe that they had forecasted we would sell 10,000 copies of it. Back then, a game of 100,000 was a real hit. You know, our Eye of the Beholder games at 300,000 plus for mega hits, and 10,000 units was not so big, but if you could get to 100,000, you had an A. We ended up selling at least 60,000 Dunes in the first couple of, Dune 2s in the first couple of weeks, Sales fell off sharply, partially because uh, Virgin wasn't prepared for the manufacturing load, and so they couldn't manufacture them quickly enough. At the time, after a month or two, pirated version was so widely available that few people paid for it after that, which is quite sad. Um, I'm sure, certain that the number of people actually playing Dune 2 was in the hundreds of thousands. It probably was one of the biggest hits of our day. Of our day. It's just uh, that only a, a little less than 100,000, I think, lifetime ever paid for it. Anyways, uh, that actually does fit into the story a little bit. Uh, we, the, the CD-ROM had come out um, just before that as a storage device, and everybody was looking at it as a storage device. And I remember having lots of conversations. Uh, Joe Kuka was certainly in these conversations, along with um, Brett and Joe Bostic and a few of the creators of CNC, uh, Edie Laramore and others. We said, well, we don't really want to do another Dune game because dealing with a, a licensor was quite challenging and... We were already getting some grief from the guys over at the Dune books that, you know, whether or not we were extending beyond the, the reasonable use of the film library. And that's a, so we knew that we had to come up with something original. And we had started off down the path of uh, Swords and Sorcery. So it was going to be a real-time strategy game set in a fantasy universe. And we're going down that road. And um, I remember we were looking at the first video tests Aaron Powell had done. Brett was so excited. He's like, wow, we have to just do full-screen video and audio and let's go put together a proper production. And I, I don't know who came up with the idea, but certainly the collective opinion was that to try to go out and shoot all of this stuff as fantasy was going to be quite challenging and probably a little bit off the mark when you're talking about um, really wide acceptance. Uh, again, we were trying to create games that were entertaining for the average computer user, not necessarily the average gamer. And so we said, you know, we, we like these, uh, this idea, a game that would be beautiful to look at, easy to play, and really, really deep. I um, felt that gamers would never begrudge us for having high production value, but um, casual consumers would always walk away from something if it had a heavy friction interface and poor graphics. So we started working on um, a new concept, which was modern day, because if we were going to go out and shoot video, the only access we had was modern day. That didn't quite feel fanciful enough, so we thought, let's just take modern day warfare and try to push it just a little bit so that with our CG elements and a little bit of trickery of the camera and such, we could set it in a near future sort of, and, and then that's where the, the whole idea is. I, I don't want to take credit for any of this because this is all really uh, Edie Laramore and uh, Brett Sperry and Joe Bostic uh, kicking the story around and certainly Joe Cook and having a lot of input into what we could film, what we couldn't film. Eric Powell is a lead artist on the on the product too. So we started working on that. Then one of the tasks that I was given, I'd written all the compression algorithms for uh, Westwood at the time, so fine arts guy, but also computer science guy. And so Chris Yates had gotten some people from the university, and um, I started working with the uh, a doctor out there, and I, I'm sorry, so sorry, I just don't remember his name, coming up with a real-time video compression algorithm. To the best of my knowledge, nothing ever could do except for our player, uh, full-screen audio and video, um, off a single speed CD ROM. So that was actually a real challenge. And I still remember Brett saying to me, Oh, Lou, you're just being lazy. It can be done. <laughs> <laughs> so, so we ended up using these, these really archaic and old compression algorithms back from the days of. Um, trying to get as much stuff onto floppy disks and fast loaders as possible. So I have to take our, our listeners way back. My, my apologies for rambling here, but it's kind of interesting how history comes into this. 
way back in the day when we worked for Epics, you had to have your games load pretty quickly or people would get bored and just stop loading them. Um, very similar to web page loading in the recent history. Uh, even on the devices, you had these serial connections that had very, very little data throughput. So compression algorithms back then were not designed so much to save space, although that certainly helped. They were really designed to make the loading faster. So because of that, the core algorithms that uh, I wrote um, with Barry Green throughout the years at Westwood turned out to be the best way to take the code books from the sort of stylized LZW compression um, and the uh, movement masks from MPEG and actually compress them in this method that we used way back in like the early 80s. And so that's actually what led to the full screen video and audio and gave us enough processing speed to be able to actually load that stuff, cue it, and play it. We could actually play the video faster than we could load the actual images off of a hard drive at the time. So we couldn't watch any of those movies in real time on consumer de devices. We had to watch them on you know, on film stock, or on film stock, up beta SP stock. The only time we ever get to see the movies in a compressed format in real time was after the compression algorithm had, had compressed them and our real-time players had played them. It's pretty, pretty cutting-edge stuff. And that led to the, the whole CNC universe. Um, really, it was this idea that Here's this accessible, accessible story meme of, of the next war won't be between nations, it'll be between um, terrorists and uh, non-terrorists, or the organized nations and terrorists. I do want to point out something, too, because a lot of people who play CNC just assume that this was after 9-11 and, and uh, that the story was set. But if you look back at the history, we were many, many years before 9-11. This story was written in 93. So this was strangely and somewhat creepily prophetic. Osama bin Laden becomes this charismatic figure from the deserts of the Middle East, leading a, um, a rebellion against uh, organized armies with terrorist cells everywhere. And that was essentially the, the bones of CNC, but way before it had actually happened in real life. And one of the things I was a little, uh, looking back, I wish we had taken smaller steps in our in our game history because I think we went with Tiberian Sun a little too far into the future for our sequel product in the Tiberian universe. It would have been nice to have had well, that's actually why we said Renegade in between the two, um, because there was a whole bunch of things that we could tell between the two stories. That being said, you know, it, it, it is what it is, as it were, and uh, I'm very happy with Tips, and it was a great game. Well, my first question is, uh, what do you think about CNC, how it turned out, where it was going, and what would you like to see it become in the future? Uh, okay, lots of questions there. Let's start yeah. with the first one. What do I think about CNC in the past? I'm very happy with, um, you know, certainly all the Tiberian games uh, that I've been involved in, and I was I was pretty heavily involved all the way up to CNC three. The last one I didn't have much to do with, um, and I was just I was I thought that the guys did a reasonable job given the constraints they had, but they were they were heavily heavily constrained when it came to budget and production and such. So uh, so I think it uh, it certainly didn't live up to the kind of glory that we could have done with the, even a tenth of the budget of what the competing Blizzard products were doing. But I was very happy with the early games, obviously. Um, when we were, were acquired by uh, Electronic Arts, Brett and I had made the, the decision to move the CNC franchise to Irvine because Irvine Studio was a, a newer studio. We wanted to make sure to have a, a, a solid foundation for them to build products off of uh, so they could have something reliable quite confident in our Las Vegas studio's ability to continue to make original products and so we kicked off a bunch of new original products in Vegas and moved the CNC franchise down to Irvine and that meant a whole new lead of a uh, whole, whole new troop of creators so then we went to um, product was moved down there and, and truth be told I mean the the folks at Westwood were getting a little crispy when it came to real strategy that was now we're talking 1998 uh, we've been doing this for many, many years. Um, back then, game cycles were typically, you know, a year or maybe two to have a to have game cycles like Tipson that were three years and such. That was just it was really, really hard. So the team was ready to do new stuff. Brett wanted to go out and build a quick little space opera, massive multiplayer game to get our chops built up around how to build massive multiplayer, so then we could turn around and use one to build the CNC, build one in the CNC universe. Um, I was really interested in first-person shooters, so I was taking on Renegade. So we had a couple of new concepts that were in the CNC universe that we were trying to build our steps toward, while the Irvine guys were going to work on taking uh, Red Alert to the next level. And um, yeah, Dustin Browder and Mark Skaggs and some guys that are really talented guys, they had a really strong uh, kind of lean toward the Blizzard games. And so with the start of um, Command & Conquer Generals, 
I was one of the senior studio leaders, Bing Gordon of EA, was really adamant that we didn't need to have all this high production video value. It was you know, This stuff was really expensive. It wasn't adding a lot of value to the games. And we should be trying to do this stuff in, in game. And I, I think he's not wrong, and it wasn't wrong in a certain sense, as if you could do it all in game, in game cinematics, as later Bioware and others would prove, turned out to be much more engaging. But at the time, the technology just really wasn't up for it. They went off on a path to kind of eliminate the real time video components of the game um, and in an effort to put more money toward game design and maps and then they brought in a lot of GUI and other elements that were really inspired by the Blizzard games um, and I think at that point with Generals, the CNC Generals line sort of lost some of its uniqueness as a CNC product which was uh, possibly good or bad and in no time will, you know, there's no way to go back and reverse history and find out. But I think that came back again with Tiberium Games uh, CC3 and, and beyond back at the ILA, but it uh, it still had this sort of feeling that it was trying to be a Blizzard game, which I think is is, is not necessarily the right thing to do for franchises. If um, if all first person shooters had tried to be uh, Call of Duty, uh, those franchises tend to die, and and that's typically what we see happen in, in all, yeah. all versions. And that's sort of a lesson learned for me is you know find your unique space and, and own that unique space, even if even if most other games do things a little differently. If it's if it's not obviously wrong. Um, or just, you know, people like changing control sets probably doesn't work, but if you have something that's unique, try to hold on to the unique, uniqueness of it. So that sort of gives you a sense of how I feel about the CNC games. That being said, um, Red Alert 2, Yuri's Revenge, with the Yuri's Revenge pack, was still to this day my favorite game to play in the real-time strategy genre of all real-time strategy games, even ours and others. I just thought that the, the three sides were dramatically different and were just so much fun to play. And, and I love the fact that they were... They were so different that even if you weren't the best uh, person in the world, or actually the second person in the world, you could still compete by having just a, a kind of really uh, fundamental understanding of how the, how the units could be used uh, cleverly. Hats off to the guys in Irvine, they did a beautiful job with that game. Um, and since then, I'd, I'd say I'd love to see CNC come back to its heritage. If if it's going to be a Tiberium game, I would highly suggest that there be a lot of research back into the original game world universe and make sure to cap recapture some of those things that were unique about it because uh, it would distinguish it from others. If anybody's going to do that, um, they, they need to make sure they put aside a very large budget because StarCraft II and excellent games like that have set the bar very, very high. I don't think that you can get to a competitive product or even a product that consumers are going to warm to um, trying to do it on the cheap. And that may be different in console, or I'm sorry, in uh, mobile space tablets. I don't know that I would do a CNC product in that in that world yet. I'd probably want to make sure I understood how to make one that really felt true to the roots first. But uh, but that's a great space, and one that I'm currently uh, developing in is in the uh, what do we cross between real time strategy games and uh, tower defense games on tablets. Well, then I guess you kind of already answered my next question because it was going to be what was your favorite CNC game. <laughs> That's okay. It's that cool. was my favorite one to play. I thought the acting and stuff was a little over the top, although that was somewhat fun. My favorite one to as, a, as an entertainment experience, not so much as an RTS game, but my favorite one as an entertainment experience was certainly Tiberian Sun. The whole, the whole everything about that game was was just really cool. There were so many innovations, and there was a lot of nuances in it that were really nice. And the the video production was just. Uh, amazingly good in my opinion. Yeah, honestly, Tiberian Sun is where I started picking up in the series, so for me that was like my favorite game. Personally, I loved Anton Slavic as a character, and Joe Kukin, huge heroes, huge idols still today. I never thought I'd be interviewing you here, <laughs> so that's another big wow. Um, you know. uh, no worries, we're easily fine, actually. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I... You know, it's, it's funny, because people always assume that game makers are celebrities, and, and we're very strongly followed by very few people. <laughs> well, you'd be surprised. A lot, of the, a lot of the CNC people are like, hey, when are you guys going to interview somebody cool? So I just messaged you, and... And here we are. So, hey, I didn't think it was going to happen. I really didn't. I figured, you know, there's people I've asked, hey, can I interview you? And they're like, no, I'm busy. I'm doing other stuff. So I'm like, I didn't, it's not that I was expecting you to just shoot me down and say no, but I know as game devs, you guys have your own lives. You're constantly doing something in the industry. And I didn't want to take your time away from something else. Well, I appreciate that. I, actually, to be honest, um, I've always made myself pretty available to the, the press, the fans, um, it's, it's to me it's been way before it was chic I felt like the biggest relationship we have is between the creators and the consumers we have to know what you I always used to say this in my presentations as a in the EP training I used to do which is 
you have to listen to the fans to listen to what they want next, and you have to interpret that to know how to exceed their emotional expectations. Because if you do what they tell you to do, you're just going to end up doing the things that that you just did. And it won't feel new and exciting. But if you understand what it is they find exciting about your work and what they're hoping to see in the future, you can reach beyond the the following what you've done and actually create that next step that that they instinctively really want. And and you know you've been successful if they all say, yeah, 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 that's exactly what we were talking about, even though it's certainly not probably what they were talking about. (laughs) Yeah. Well, you're exactly right. I, I truly wish more people, some of EALA, some of them listened but had no power in how to fix what CNC4 became. And we all know how that turned out, so I'm not going to go there. I really truly yeah, no, wish... I, I don't ever bash. Um, it's... Sorry, sorry. Sorry, oh, go ahead. No, no, I just... I mean, I'm not bashing CNC because I eat, sleep, and breathe it. But, I mean, it wasn't... CNC4, to me, did not fill CNC. I mean, yes, it had Kane in it, and it had GDI and Nod. But when you take a mobile construction vehicle out of a game that had one for years... It doesn't, it changes the dynamics of the game. And maybe that's what they were going for. But it, to me, that game honestly well, did not feel CNC. It felt like more like Star Trek or something. Yeah, it's, it's kind of a strange, um, it's a difficulty. But, uh, you know, he had, a, again, a whole new turnover of creatives there. And in defense of that particular team, um, they were being tasked with doing something uh, different enough to, to sort of reboot the not the franchise per se because it's sort of meant to be the last of the franchise, but to reboot the interest in real time strategy. Yeah. And so they took um, some create they took some creative gambles. Uh, they did some things that uh, I, I do think that from a video production point of view, one of the things that made CNC so charming was that the people who were doing the work were truly doing their best. Nobody thought it was campy at the time. Nobody shot for being kind of wonky and off base, and I think that's continues to be a mistake in the games industry is when people they, they believe that um by their their sense of humor their sense of uh, deprecation of the of the medium will become campy and humorous and the reality is if they just do their best the, in the best case they'll actually create something worthy of film or television in the worst case they'll try to get to that they'll get something close and it'll have that nice campy feel that feels right so i always encourage people shoot for pure realism don't don't try for campy uh, you know you unless you have brilliant comedic writers like uh, Matt and Trey or somebody like that or Seth MacFarlane or somebody who knows you know really understands comedy you don't don't try for comedy try try for the serious stuff because at least then that at worst case scenario you'll come off a little campy and at least it'll show some love so uh, yeah so I don't the reason I started I started to say this was I try not to criticize games uh, in general because hundreds of people put a lot of their blood sweat and tears into them and they it's um, every bit as hard and in my experience actually often hard to make a game that doesn't succeed than one that succeeds. Weirdly, the ones that tend to take off and be hugely successful, somehow, even though they were painful at the time, somehow it just seems like they just they somehow clicked better. That's probably because they were the, the concept was clearer, the leadership and the team was in line, or who knows what the stars were aligned. I'm not sure what. I wish I had a formula and I'd, I'd repeat it. But um, but I never try to, to be too hard on game creators and troll them too badly because it is a lot of work to try to get one of those products out. And I feel most products have at least one or two elements that are that are really neat and really exciting and really fun to see um, and sometimes gets drowned out and people just sort of saying, well, it didn't live up to my expectations as unreasonable as they were. I don't know if you guys ever played Knack, but uh, you know um, it was one of the Sony launch titles. And I just thought it was a charming game. It was a lot of fun. And, man, it just got bashed in the press for no reason. Yeah, it uh, did. It just doesn't make any sense. And, you know, I tell people all the time, you should go play it. It's a fun game. There's nothing wrong with it. It's really a shame that um, the fans weren't as excited about the last product. I, I, I think the team took what would be, you know, at the time, very reasonable and understandable risks. Uh, they just didn't work out. And, and that happens sometimes. Yeah, mm. it does. And like, like and I said, also, I'm... They were also Horribly constrained, by the way. Horribly yeah. budget constrained. <laughs> yeah, well, that's that was the main thing. And I think the fans sort of it was kind of forced. Like, you know, CNC, for the most part, besides Renegade, was always RTS, RTS. And they were kind of making this more as like a an RTS rolled into an MMO. And it just, to me, it honestly didn't feel CNC. And I'm not knocking the guys much respect for what they did. But it just, to me, it never really felt like CNC. It was like CNC, partly WoW, Star Trek kind of all shoved into one. It was, 
a diff- and the music was kind of weird in yeah. the end too. I, you know, it t- it didn't feel C and C to me. Well, when you change that many creative to people, it, it's tough. I mean, uh, you mentioned another game though quickly in that reply, which was Renegade. What was great about Renegade and what felt completely C and C about Renegade was the multiplayer base versus base. That was an uh, absolute riot. It was so much fun. Um, we were plagued with technical problems even after launch, and so it never really quite met to its, its true glory. But uh, wow, was that a great, fun thing. I wish we had not been quite so aggressive to try to do everything and had just stuck to that mechanic because if we had started there and ended there, I think that game would have just been, I mean, it would have been a whole new trend center. It was really, really fun. If you get a chance on Renegade X, Renegade X, X has been rebooted out there, and if you play it, um, you know, they really did a nice job of bringing it to the modern day, so it, at least it gives people a hint of what might have been. Oh, yeah. Me me and NSG, we, we play it We play it a few times every now and then. We try yeah. to get together, and we, we play a couple games together. Yeah, the- yeah, that base versus base stuff, so it still hasn't been done. Man. Nobody's done anything quite like it. It's uh, it's really a cool concept, and one day one day something will, will lean into that strongly, and um, you know, it'll, I think it'll be as a potential to be like a, a mobile revolution where people name it something new, and that becomes the the, the new kind of strategy genre. <laughs> Renegade was one of my favorite games, first person shooter running around. The first game I ever started out, my first love really isn't first-person shooters. I started out playing Doom 2 on a floppy disk on a PC. Ever since then, I love first-person shooters, but my love is really in CNC. If I if I had the chance to work on anything CNC, you know, besides our web show, I would probably just die of a heart attack because this is like insanely awesome. And if I had to pick one game that I could play over and over, it would probably be Tiberian Sun. Because I get in there and I play multiplayer all the time. It's awesome. That's one of the things I said about the total entertainment experience for um, Tiberian Sun was just well-crafted. And also, I think Tib- Tiberian Sun suffered from being too subtle in a lot of ways. Um, the effects of the terrain deformation, the effects of um, the um, experience for the units called veterancy, and things like that that um, were really just new concepts for the genre, unfortunately were a little underplayed. I don't have a good reason for why that was. We just... When we went to balance them, I think that we were just a little concerned about going too far. Many of the of the features that I just mentioned just didn't really punch it the way they should. With Red Alert uh, 2, we, we made a conscious effort not to make that mistake. And so when a, when a unit upgraded in the field, it made a big difference in the unit's abilities. And so you really felt felt rewarded for keeping that unit alive. In Tiberian Sun, the, the, the same effect was there, but people just sort of missed it. And it's, uh, it goes back to the uh, Sid's rule of double or have. You know, his design talk years ago, he said, uh, and it resonated with me after, after the fact, which was, if you have anything and you really want people to notice it, you have to sort of double its effect or have its effect for people to, to, to notice it. And I still bring that into my designs today, and it uh, affects things as I think about, you know, rewarding players. That sort of exponential growth is really important for people to recognize it. My next question for you is what's your favorite music from CNC? Which soundtrack just clicks with you? You know, full disclosure, my, my cousin Frank Lepaki is the one who did most of the music for the series, and so I've always loved Frank's work. <laughs> my favorite music that he ever did for any of our games, by the way, was um, was Monopoly. He takes uh, music through the ages, through the, and it's just amazing what he does with a musical journey in that game is, is just spectacular. I, I guess that's probably why I would say my favorites are probably either uh, Renegade or Tiberian Sun. Both had brilliant soundtracks, which just really helped to cement the world and felt felt perfect to me. The work he did on the original CNC was certainly um, earth-breaking work, as it were. You know, it was really ahead of its time because of the compositions that he put together and the fact there was so much original composed music for it. Tips on Slash Renegade, hard for me to decide between the two in the CNC, theory, in the CNC series. In my opinion, I have, like, two favorite tracks from Tiberian Sun, which happened to be Scouting and mutants and then in renegade i actually like work out to the command and conquer where it goes command and conquer i'm like i love that yeah <laughs> <laughs> well of all that that's all the, the music i would say the one song hell's march or red alert uh red alert was so amazing that do 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 Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. yep. I was like, okay, yep. this is cool. <laughs> yeah, his his hell march that never gets old. Since we yeah. were since we were kind of going into like nine eleven, what are yeah. your thoughts on the nine eleven the red alert box art that you guys had to like pull back off shelves that had the oh, twin I think towers? That it was the right thing to do. You know, we had done the artwork obviously months before, and we had just 
literally just ship the game into the stores and then of course this, this tragedy hits and the, the, we had a big debate about it we had no way obviously no way of knowing that that was going to occur so the responsible thing to do was to pull the, the product from the shelves and reissue the box art you know there's some people that would say oh you're giving in all sorts of things I, we got letters people pining that you know we were letting the terrorists win all the way to how could you have been so insensitive to put it out in the first place you're just looking for shock value uh, obviously none of that was true what the, just the reality was we had imagined this world of the Russians attacking America, and what was the biggest symbol of America's supremacy from a monetary point of view was the Twin Towers. So to have that was the perfect iconology. It's actually obviously why the terrorists chose. So you know, my thoughts on that are: we did exactly the right thing. We did it as quickly as we possibly could, and you know, I, I fully defend the the, the sort of economic uh, cost of that as being the responsible thing to do. I mean, I agree. I actually, I have a box because I was in fourth oh, grade yeah. and. Uh, was able to, I didn't get a copy of it then, actually I had to go and buy it off of eBay now in the present day, but I actually have a box just to kind of have a collector thing, and I don't think you, I know for a fact, obviously talking to you now, and as you guys being game devs, you're not going to put out a box that's going to spark a controversy just so people will buy a game, and you know, for the people that even... No, 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 we certainly didn't want Yeah, and for the people that even said that to you guys... I think that everybody was in shock. We were, you know, shocked that this happened and then saw that and we were just furious about what happened. So anything related to that, frustrations probably just got taken out. The, the, the accusations of um, profiteering off of a tragedy were the appropriate response if you believe that people are doing that. And I don't blame anybody for having that initial response. But when they see what we did as a response to the event... If we had left it out there and just simply stood by the fact that we had done it beforehand, I think that um, we would still have been guilty through inaction. We would have been guilty of benefiting from the sensationalism of it, and, and I think that would have been a huge mistake. And, and oddly, this, the press still picked it up and made a big story about the fact that we pulled the, the cover art, not always accurately representing the fact that the art was created long before the events took place. But, but that's, again, it's like a, there's just a, a catch-22 there. You know, Some people even said, well, the only reason you pulled it is to get the press coverage of pulling it. It's like, look, you know, damned if you do damned if you don't in our case i think on balance the right thing to do and the responsible thing to do is to pull the boxes and we didn't hesitate i mean i make it sound like we had this big debate we really didn't we said oh my god we can't have this out here that's just a horrible thing it's not the right imagery that's not what we want we're in a fantasy world we don't want to get that close to the bone so we uh we immediately decided to pull it president ea with uh larry probst who took that stuff very seriously as well and did a, did a wonderful i mean he supported us 100 percent you could easily see a company saying hey we've got all those units in the field we just want to capitalize on that and so i think uh, ea did all the right things in that case that's also one of the reasons that um i was very uncomfortable initially with uh, the the course that generals went with because the themes in the first generals were a little too much off the front pages one of the things i really liked about um the original command and conquer series um, and the red alert series was we were able to put into our storylines things that were very important and um, present day issues but we were able to do them in a way that was in a fictional universe where it wasn't it wasn't quite so personal. Uh, and and the way that I like to allude to that is um, if you watched all the old Twilight Zones that were on television in the uh, I guess they were in the sixties and seventies, they would often take on topics that were quite sensitive at the time, racism and uh, sexism and objectification of women, and they were able to do them in such a way. Because they did them in fictional universes and they did them with fictional characters, they could get somebody to step outside of their current biases and see a, an issue, perhaps in a new light. And I right. thought that's what we had accomplished with Command & Conquer. We certainly didn't anticipate the terrorist-driven world that we're in now. The GDI and the NOD organization were just different enough to where we could tell some of those stories without it feeling disrespectful to the men and women that serve in our armed services and, and others around the world, or the victims of terrorism. When they went to generals, they, they was a little closer to reality, and it made me quite uncomfortable. I support it as a creative choice, because again, you have to support your creative teams, but uh, as a creator myself, that just felt a little hard. I could even get into Blade Runner or two, because we had all sorts of adult themes in Blade Runner, but we were a T-rated game, yeah. for, the, for the same reasons. If I send you some stuff with like a, you know, like a pre-labeled thing to send stuff back, to me, would you be willing to sign some stuff for the fans? Sure. Okay. Sure. Just as long as it doesn't show up with a pallet and a forklift. <laughs> no. No, no, that will be for my so personal it's collection. It's reasonable. <laughs> no, 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 no. See, that, that will show well, up for my personal collection if I, if I do that. <laughs> um, I never mind uh, 
signing things for fans and stuff, I think it's very flattering and um, I'm humbled that people are still following products that I made so long ago and, and have a hand in. And I'll do my best to get, if somebody says they would really like to have a signature from Blank Blank Blank, I'll even help to try to help you get that as a collector's item because a lot of people have tried, tried to find people and it's, it's sometimes difficult to find the individuals that contributed to the series. Happy to help. Okay. And really not hard to find, actually. Weirdly enough, a lot of people, have, uh, back when I was running Mafia Wars briefly at Zynga, you know, I, I made my personal email and cell phone available to our whale community and people were shocked because they just assumed that it was some underling that was going to filter all that. And no, it went right to my cell phone. <laughs> you know, I, I've never shied away from contact with the, the fans and with the people that consume the products I've been in charge of because, I mean, quite frankly, you know, I, I don't get to do what I do unless they're out there. So hats off to you guys who volunteer so much time and energy into keeping our franchise alive and keeping the communities excited. Um, you know, it's, it's with, without all of you, it's uh, it's a much paler world, and uh, I love the color that you bring, and you're part of the experience as much as the people who create it. And I think that's what's really nice about game making nowadays is there's just so many avenues to reach out and touch and feel directly with the fans. One of the things that, that's greatly aided in game design, although like any good tool, it can be abused, is all of the analytics that are available now. So we don't have to go into test groups to see if our suppositions are correct. We can actually test them in the live market, um, and we can do it in a really sneaky way so people can't lie to us and tell us what they think they want to hear. <laughs> we get to see what they actually did. That goes back to what I was saying before about fans will often say, why don't you do a game again like uh, Tiberian Sun? I really loved when I played Tiberian Sun. Just do another one like that. The reality is what they're really saying is, I want to feel the same way I felt when I played the game Tiberian Sun. You know, sadly, as, as creators, the one thing we can't do is do that game again if we want you to feel that way again, because you've already felt that way. We have to figure out the next thing to do that, that pushes those same emotional buttons. One of the things that fine artists deal with all the time is this incredible volume of, of historical work, and for you to make people feel excited by something, you have to be able to intentionally create that emotional response. That's a really big challenge. The next time uh, the sequel to a wonderful franchise like uh, Call of Duty or Halo or whatever comes out and you feel like, wow, that didn't quite make me feel as good as the first time I played it, realize that even if you felt an inkling of that first time, that's an incredible accomplishment. Ready? Unfortunately, I have to get going. No problem. I, have, I gotta get to work this morning. <laughs> All right. Well, you guys take care and feel free to reach out anytime. All right. Thank, thank you for oh. your interview. Take care. Bye-bye. Uh -huh, bye. Bye. Bye.